so i think we are live right now uh, anybody can hear us am i audible could you please anyone confirm i think yes thank you so much good afternoon all welcome to our most awaited online book release program introducing the greek god helios and the indian deity surya today we have our guest with us the author of the book professor osman bokeratti hello sir welcome to the program and thank, thank you for giving us the opportunity to publish your valuable research from our publication unit which is the ink beyond imagination though he needs no introduction but he i would like to take the opportunity to formally introduce him with our audience professor usman bopiaracci is the emeritus director of research of the french national center for scientific research he is the former adjunct professor of central and south asian art archaeology and numismatics university of california berkeley he is the former visiting professor and member of the doctoral school of the paris sorbonne university he is the renowned numismatist art historian and archaeologist once again we we'll welcome you sir and thank you for all your support now we welcome our guest professor suchandra ghosh she is she is presently professor in the department of history university of hyderabad she broadly takes interest in political cultural history of northwest india early india's linkage with uh, early india's linkages with early southeast asia indian ocean buddhist and trade network and the history of everyday life she is a recipient of a number of fellowships scholarships and awards professor ghosh acted as sectional president ancient india section for the 80th session of indian history congress and regional history congress in west bengal and punjab in 2019 she was visiting professor in paris center for historical studies jnu and department of history jabalpur university i thank you from the core of my heart for accepting our invitation and kindly agreeing to be part of the today's discussion ma'am we welcome you again thank you very much now it's time to welcome professor monica zin our respected guest from germany thank you ma'am for your kind consent and support towards today's program professor zin taught indian art history at the institute for indology in munich between 1994 and 2016 since april 2016 professor zin leads to the uh, leads the team of the research center buddhist morals of kutha on the northern silk road at the saxon academy of sciences her special interest lies with the art in ancient andhra pradesh we thank you again and welcome to the book release program ma'am now i welcome professor tianshu zhu our prestigious guest from macau she is the associate professor in the department of history at the university of macau Her research focuses on Buddhist art in Central Asia, China, and India, with an emphasis on studying visual representations in the context of religious practices and cultural transmission and transformation. She also dabbles in Chinese popular re religion um, of the Canton area. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind presence, and we welcome you all again. So we are honored to have you all with us. in this afternoon now before we delve into the main program i would like to welcome and thank all the participants who have joined us across the globe and now i request uh, professor shukandra ghosh to kindly moderate the discussion session and the platform is now all yours ma'am thank you so much thank you smita it's a great honor and privilege to actually initiate and moderate a discussion of a book the let us show the book 
this is a wonderful book, uh, which is called The Greek God Helios and the Indian Deity Surya, a study in the dissemination of sun god imagery by the celebrated scholar and, of course, a dear friend, uh, Professor Osman Bopiarici. So uh, when you just see the book and you just flip through the pages, you are stunned because you see, you flip through and you find that uh, the book, uh, the, the, there is the two images uh, that welcome you are the Virupaksha temple in Patadakal and the Surya Narana temple in Aihol. And you often wonder that why this is book on Helios and Gandhar and how come these are here? And then, then you have to go into the details of the book and then you will realize the cross-cultural fertilization, which is the very essence of the book, which Professor Bopirachi is talking about here. So he has worked a lot on these kind of interactions and exchanges, cross-cultural fertilization, and the book actually gives you an idea of all these things. And uh, the secondly, a very important part of the book is that where he talks about uh, there is a succinct discussion on the origin and development of the iconography of Surya in India. Then also he draws our attention to the representation of Surya in a Buddhist context and then how Surya actually was depicted in a Brahminical context in these temples. So this, I mean, this is the wonderful way to bring in Gandhar, the southern part of India together and work on see the hybridity and the cultural plurality of the region of the subcontinent. So now, um, without much ado, I would like to welcome a very uh, senior and very reputed scholar, Professor Monica Zin, to say a few words about the book. Thank you, Monica. It's yours. Many thanks, Suchandra. Good afternoon from, or good evening from Leipzig. I was asked by the organizers of this event to say to say to the potential reader of the book something about it. It appears to me the best way to say what is the book about. So what is it about? One would say, what can it be about if not about the sun gods? In fact, you will find indeed information about sun gods in it, in it, but it is not the main subject of the book. Information about Helios, Sol Invictus or Surya is easy to find in this day and age. The book is about much more complex issues. It is about taking over the forms which we often call iconography or imagery from one culture in order to fill, it, fill them with ideas and beliefs of another. The forms remain, can be modified, but the meaning becomes a new one. Anyone who deals with art will know straight away that this is a fundamental problem in the history of art that can never be solved in the general way. What is actually adopted into another culture? Only the form or the meaning as well? As we know from the most famous example, Zeus in the form of eagle, who carries off the shepherd Ganymede into the air, he became Garuda with Nagini in Gandhara. The form remained, the meaning became completely new one. Often it is amazing how far such process, processes can go. Iranian gods in Hindu garb, wrote Franz Grenet about Zoroastrian pantheon in Sogdiana. We only think we see Indra or Surya or Shiva, but this is only their form. In Kucha, on the Northern Silk Road, every one of you would immediately recognize Shiva and Vishnu, only that they belong under the demons and turn in time into one mighty Asura. The iconography stays and can be recognized in Japanese popular comics still today. 
The new book by Professor Boperacci deals with such phenomena when the form has remained the same and the meaning has been changed. This is, however, an interesting thing in the study of the solar gods, that the main meaning of the solar deity has remained unchanged at any times. The image of sun god in the chariot drawn by two or four horses invented very long time ago in Greece was so outstanding that it shaped the iconography of peoples throughout Asia. A truly universal image of the sun riding across the sky. This must be kept in mind. It was this Greek image that was adopted in India, although the sources since Veda described Surya differently, like on the courage of seven horses. It is extremely difficult to deal with such issues since even the naming of the phenomena is a challenge. Art historians like to speak of syncretism, that is amalgamation of different ideas into a new combined understanding. This is true, of course, and it is easy to imagine that they were, for example, Indianized Greeks in Bactria who saw and worshipped Helios and Surya in one representation. But what about Surya in Bodhgaya or Orissa? We know that the model is Greek, but the ancient Indian viewer did not know it. For him, it was only Surya. So Syncretis is the of the depiction. It is for, for us only. This is what the book is about. Syncretic iconographies, not only of the solar deities, but also deities of winds, for example, mixing of traditions, adaptations of iconography to the new religious environment, assimilations of form. Boperacci's results are fascinating. On the coins, one can observe how fast the meaning has been shifted. For example, when God Helios with blazing nimbus is inscribed in, on Kucha's coins as Mitra, Iranian solar deity. And this continues and can be observed in the, by the Iranian culture influenced areas of Great Gandhara. The Surya in chariot about the colossal Eastern uh, Buddha in Bamiyan should not be called Surya at all. This is Mitra as their mythical hybrid deities, big, small beings with birds uh, under bodies in his vicinity. They were masks of Zoroastrian priests. Since Buddhist art is in the center of my own research, this part of Boperacci's book is of the main interest for me. What Surya meant in Buddhism? That we can only guess. The Buddha came from the solar dynasty. His enlightenment took place in the moment of the sunrise. The depiction of Surya within the Buddha's legend might perhaps to do something with it. But if it was so, what, why it was not represented everywhere else, like in Ajanta or Andhra? But maybe it was. And we only forgot how to read it. Boperacci goes further and reminds us about now forgotten older research, which saw solar god in the person of the Buddha. This elucidation, which really explains a lot, has been forgotten because we like to see the Buddha as a historical person. Fresh ideas are coming. There is a Tokarian text on the Northern Silk Road, which calls itself the miracle of sunrise. But it is nothing else as the adoration of the Buddha, but various gods. Perhaps the Buddha like a sun god. 
Altogether, it is really worthwhile to read the new book by Boperacci to get fresh views. The form alone, the pure iconography, is not enough. It may be adopted from somewhere else. A deep analysis from several points of view and in connection with the local culture and the study of historical development is necessary to understand what is behind the form. And this is what the book offers. And this is what it is about. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zin, for uh, finishing with uh, the last lines are so important that it is an iconography or a study. It's not just merely looking at the right hand or left hand, what is there in the right hand or left hand. It, is, it has a particular context. It has to be situated historically. And scholars like you, Professor Bapirachi and others actually do this. And that's it's so fascinating. And the other question she raised was, why don't we find so many Suryas in further south? That is also a question that has to be reckoned with. Now we have with us, Professor Tianshu Zhu, a young scholar uh, who has worked a lot on these issues. And may I request Professor Zhu to carry forward with your thoughts on the book? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's, um, uh, I'm very honored to be here uh, for uh, the, the, so the, uh, the new book of Osmond, uh, the study on the dissemination of the sun god image. Um, the representation of the sun god uh, with a very unique iconography, but also with great variations in early Buddhist art in India and Gandhara and in Central Asia of the 5th and 7th century is actually a very interesting phenomenon that has driven scholars' attention already for very long. Um, his book, as you can see here, uh, it's actually a very thorough and also comprehensive study on the topic. When I was reading the book, I just had a feeling that, you know, this is just um, uh, going to be like the other books of him that I'm going to go back over and over again. Uh, so for people who uh, haven't read the book, so I can uh, you know, tell you or I can show you that uh, you know, you're, you're going to find uh, sort of like a, a previous studies of the very old ones and also the very updated ones. It's in a very intense manner. And also the analysis of the images is also in much greater detail. Uh, than previous studies, um, also supported with very good uh, illustration. Um, I, although this book, uh, you know, it's a, a standard sort of like an academic monograph, um, I will have to say uh, it is very easy to read. Um, this is um, uh, my feeling. Uh, <clears throat> the structure is very clear. The reader can easily follow the author's argument and can understand, follow, uh, or get the main point of the book. Uh, so the main point, uh, if I uh, sort of um, understand correctly, is those sun god images in Buddhist context, uh, which most of them they are, uh, whether Greek uh, heroes, Indian Surya, or Iranian Mitra, they all have symbolic meaning. Uh, the meaning would be designated the Buddha like the sun. Uh, so uh, I want to make uh, a few comments uh, for, uh, for, for general audience. Um, besides the clarification or uh, the detailed study on specific images uh, discussed in the book, I also feel there's some kind of uh, significance in general for uh, young scholars. Uh, so this is a few points I want to I wanna make. First, uh, uh, in the uh, tradition of studying uh, art history, uh, we focus on 
study iconography uh, in art history, we focus on images themselves, uh, regardless uh, where they are depicted, uh, you know, uh, what images may be placed um, next to the image and so on. So, but in this book, once you open it, the author started with a Surya image depicted on the headdress of a Bodhisattva image. Uh, so this is how he raised the question uh, with a uh, contact. And uh, the ultimately what it studied in this book is not about the sun god images themselves, but like their meaning, their function with the Buddha image uh, in a Buddhist context. So this is what I feel can be very inspiring uh, to uh, sort of uh, young scholars, uh, the, you know, the, the last, the past two decades witnessed the growth of a large body of young scholars in the field and also like new approaches in the study of Buddhist art. Uh, so this is, I feel, represents something uh, so we can learn as a good, very good example how we deepen the study in the field. The second sort of a deep impression um, I, I have is, um, uh, you know, uh, in the modern division of the field today, um, the history of Buddhist art is an independent field. So therefore, uh, because of this, a student uh, in the study of this field is often not familiar with anything else. Uh, for instance, like, Hindu mythology, Greek mythology, or and um, uh, Zoroastrian mythology. Uh, even if they are familiar with one of them, probably not all. Um, and also images, they are often studied with them or from the perspective of Buddhism. Uh, the inference can be recognized only from one direction. Uh, so this is um, another uh, sort of my impression with the book. I really admire how Osmond he's uh, undertaken of all four religions, and he is able to recognize uh, mutual uh, sort of influence. Uh, for instance, when he studied the images on the toilet tree, uh, you know, uh, a common way is to recognize. Uh, Greek image, Greek iconography arrived somewhere, you know, in the Indus Valley uh, in Gandhara area. But uh, he would uh, be able to perceive this as people in Gandhara also absorbed Indian Surya iconography uh, components into uh, the uh, sort of uh, uh, Greek iconography of. Uh, Solar D of the solar solar god. Uh, so this is uh, two aspects. I feel like uh, I, I, you know, uh, without telling too much about the content, uh, which you can all go further. But uh, to comment on the general contribution of the book or where we can learn. And the last point uh, is actually a thought uh, occurred to me when I was reading the book. Um, uh, this is about the significance of the topic. So what is exactly the topic? The images of sun god, a very international image uh, depiction uh, occurred in the past about the, the sun god. Uh, not long ago, uh, we were very optimistic on the notion of globalization. And um, uh, recent years, we seem to move to an opposite direction, uh, especially right now, during the new Cold War between China and the States, and especially currently the Ukraine crisis. Uh, so when, only when I think back uh, at now, uh, you know, right now, uh, can I understand better than what was the so-called globalization we experienced, uh, you know, just uh, shortly. Um, 
that was after the Cold War period, when we only had uh, one uh, unipolar power in the world. So it was, uh, in essence, the globalization of the unipolar uh, uh, power. So if we make correction to today's, uh, you know, uh, hostile uh, attitude, uh, and also correct once we were over over open uh, optimistic uh, globalization perspective. What can we have? And this is the sort of uh, you know in our history we do have culture transmission naturally taken place peacefully and never stop like the sound god image. Uh, so this is actually when I read the book, uh, I the thought occurred to me. Uh, so um, wish the world is tolerant and peaceful, um, like the sun god images. Uh, besides all those uh, sort of like generic uh, sort of comments on the contribution of the book and the topic, I do have a few uh, very minor. Uh, comments on specific images. Uh, so I just name a few. Uh, um, I generally I can accept sort of the author's interpretation, uh, his interpretation of the Sangha, the image as glorifying the Buddha. Um, but I also would not want to rule out other meanings and the functions of the images. Um, I just had a brief talk with Osmond. Um, for instance, um, the, uh, the Surya image and the Indra image depicted on the um, doorway of a Vihara at Bhaja. Uh, so besides uh, Surya being sort of um, uh, designate the Buddha as the sun god and the, the, the Indra uh, as you know, designating the Buddha uh, for whatever his mighty power. <laughs> so uh, there might be also another layer of meaning the two gods, and they are being uh, powerful, protective deities at the doorway. Uh, so this is like a, like a one of the uh, comments I have. Uh, other uh, uh, small things like the lintel, depicting Surya at one end and the episodes of the Buddha's life uh, all together from Matra. And the other end of the lintel is broken. Uh, so it is possible at the very end of the other end. Uh, might it be another deity, uh, we are not sure. Uh, or even if they do not have, then we do have in Bamiya, in Kizil, uh, the sun god is depicted with another one, for instance, moon god, uh, sort of like as a pair. In that case, definitely the sun god would have a different meaning. Uh, so, so this is sort of like my uh, my my comments. I there might be uh, multiple meanings. Uh, the the other the last one, a minor one, is. Um, uh, the sun god in disguise as a bodhisattva, this is really remarkable, uh, especially the Abhaya Mudra. Uh, this is remarkable. However, uh, uh, for instance, like in Gandhara, the generic sort of appearance of a bodhisattva and the fundamental iconography of gods, they share commonality. They have the uh, their common foundation coming from royal men of ancient Indian. So they have turban, uh, they have necklace, uh, they also have this uh, utariya, this garment. So I feel like for other things, we maybe cannot completely view them as sort of like, oh, if we see them, then this, that they, are, they are the iconography of Mudasafa. So uh, because in Gandhara gods, they also appear in similar way. Uh, so this is something like a very minor. I have also some, a couple of others, but, but I think I have enough here. <laughs> I should give time to Osmo. Thank you. 
thank you very much, Professor Zhu, for your very insightful comments. And <coughs> one second, <coughs> talking about <coughs> the importance of symbolism and how Osmond has used mythologies uh, of various things and the pertinent questions that you have raised. And finally, the sensitive and the sensible issue of globalization. Uh, so now we have Professor Osman Bapirichi with us, who will enlighten us with his thoughts, why he began to think of writing a, a book like this. And so Professor Bapirichi, it's yours. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Chandra. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Smita Halde, uh, the Inc. Uh, Beyond Imagination for publishing uh, my second book, which first one was published with Professor Sushmita Bhashu Majundar on coins. Um, and also, uh, it was not an easy task uh, with so many photographs in color um, uh, to, to publish this book. And I, one of the reasons, as Monica, uh, we publish in India because they are less expensive for the readers to buy and for the libraries to buy. So thank you, Smita. And also, I would like to thank all three of you, um, uh, Suchandra, for, uh, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, chairing or coordinating the whole session, um, and then Monica and Tianshu. Uh, the reason when, uh, when Smita asked me to organize a book launch, uh, I thought of three of you for three different reasons. Uh, Suchandra uh, is an art historian and mainly a historian working on India and mainly Southeast Asia, and also very much interested in, um, in Central Asia and also the, the, the Hellenism in Central Asia. He wrote a book on that and uh, she can read French. So when you read her, we see that she knows the French literature about the I mean, work of Paul Bernard and others. Monica, um, I always call her the goddess of Indian art. Um, uh, she has done so much contributions. I mean, not only, I mean, I'll come to Kisil and other places. First of all, I'm mean, starting with Bamiyan, uh, which Professor Shingloff and also alone, um, and looking at the art, I will mean, explain why she is different from the other art historians. And also her recent publications also uh, on uh, Amravati, Andhra Pradesh, and her recent uh, opus, I mean, it's really a magnum uh, on uh, Kanaganali Stopa. And now she's working on, um, on Kisil Caves, the paintings, and came out with uh, uh, publications. And also she's forming um, a lot of students um, on this. And one is absolutely, that's Sato Mihiyama, who is doing wonderful work on uh, Kisil and also on Tung Ho. So, the, so, and also Monica has worked on the, as, I mean, as Monica very well explained, in a brief discussion, I know she can talk for two hours on, Su uh, on Surya and Helios, on the Kisil paintings, um, but she has done much contribution. When I started this, I mean, uh, you know, apart from the Toronto um, uh, Bodhisattva image with the Surya on the headdress, I also looked at the, the toilet trays, uh, partly published by my good friend, Professor Katsumi Tanabe, and also the new toilet tray, which came into my hand, um, I asked Monica, what should I read on Surya? And Monica said, I should read Tianchu. So, I mean, she <laughs> kindly sent me her article. Then I started reading from A to Z. Um, and um, it was so intelligently written and um, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. So that's why I did not repeat everything what she wrote about the Kisil Caves and also Dong And also, I mean, she's of course started with Central Asia. Um, so she inspired me, I mean, all three of you, I mean, inspired me in every way uh, to work on this. So I, I don't want to repeat what I wrote in the book because Monica and Xianchu um, uh, very nicely summarized everything. Um, uh, what Monica said and also Xianchu is, and also, I mean, very well remarked by Suchandra, what is the role of an art historian today? Are we just going to narrate or, I mean, describe what you see on an image? Or are we going to look at an image with the message and the symbolism and the meaning? This is where all three of you differentiate from other many art historians 
not looking at the text. It is extremely important to looking at the text that comes, I mean, of course, I'm referring to the work by Professor Shingloff and Monica, uh, Monica Zinn. Uh, the importance of text, uh, um, I mean, when we, I mean, it's of course important for Greek, Roman and all the other iconographies. But since we are talking about India and also mainly on Buddhism, it is important to know the text and how they had an impact on it. Um, the first thing is all the texts are chronologically did not exist at the same time. Some texts were there and some texts are not even known. I can remember in one of his articles, um, uh, Monica wrote this. I mean, when you look at some of the iconographies in Amaravati, we can't find the text. I mean, the, the text that we use normally for Gandhara night, like Larita Vistara, Buddha Charita, Mahavastu. But apart from that, we have other texts that are not found. Uh, the, this is what I try to um, uh, express when Monica organized the conference in Leipzig, um, that the new texts are coming. Uh, it shows that there are so many texts we don't know, especially the contribution by uh, uh, Professor Richard Solomon, Mark Allen, uh, Timothy Lenz, Ingo Strau, uh, recently Professor Harry Falk. They also showed there are, from the Gandhari manuscript, there are texts. I mean, for example, we were all depending on the Pratyarish Sutra um, in the Divyavatana or the Mulya Sravastava, Vinaya, either Tibetan or Chinese. But apart from that, there were other texts. And also, the, the I mean, without talking about much about the book, the present research that I'm doing on Sri Lankan paintings, I mean, when you look at the way that the life of the Buddha is depicted on Sri Lankan paintings, there are many things that we don't see in Sanskrit texts, but we say the, we see them in Pali texts. And I wrote this in my book that uh, Tianshu um, um, explained in the Gandhara Nath, the first book, um, uh, that and also when we look at that, Monica wrote in, his, in her article, looking at Sanchi and Bharat, there are some iconographical, I mean, depictions. We don't, they don't tally with the known Sanskrit text, as if there was a text, either in Gandhari or Magadhi, or even in Sinhalese. This is what Buddha Gosha says. When Buddha Gosha translates the Nidhana Katha, he very clearly says he translated the existing vernacular, I mean, written in a vernacular language, most probably singular, into Pali, giving its, because it's Atakata, it's a commentary, giving this interpretation. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, Buddha Gosha says, I mean, I mean, dif I mean, this is what is differentiated from the Sanskrit text. You know, when Buddha left the great departure, the horse was lifted by the gods. So the, 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 the noise of the hooves may not be I mean, heard by the people in the palace. In the Pali context, in the Dhanakata, nobody came to lift the horse, but the horse flew over the wall uh, with Chan holding on to the uh, to the tail. Now, this is what we see on the on the paintings of uh, Sri Lanka. But Buddha Gosha adds something. Some people say that uh, Buddha flew over the wall, but it didn't happen. But the doors opened automatically. But if you look at all the paintings in Sri Lanka, there's no way that the doors open, but they flew over. So what I'm trying to do now is, I mean, recently I wrote to Monica about it. Um, same thing with the birth of Rahula, same thing with the first meditation. There are so many contradictions and confusions. So this is what we are doing, Monica. This is what Tianshu and Sochandra we are doing. Um, it's not just describing what we see but to see the message hidden behind it. So if I say that the, the toilet race at Tianshu was said correctly, it is not just Hellenistic art. They had some sort of, I mean, I mean, I mean inspiration from the, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Puranas and other texts, I mean, especially Rig Veda. So it is, uh, they all occur in a cross-fertilized context. This is what is, I mean, for so far, I mean, unlike Monica, I have only worked on this period uh, especially starting from the Mayan period, going up to the end of the um, end of the Gandharan period, which is very interesting, because it's completely it, it they appear in a uncodified, uh, but in a cross fertilized context. So in that context alone, that we are we can we are able to understand uh, what the the image of the uh, Surya on the 
headdress or the jatha of the bodhisattva. So then I started looking at the toilet trays. I read all your work and then went to Baja and then to, sorry, to uh, Budgaya and then to Baja and look at the um, the, the Mathura, uh, the, I mean, the one that you mentioned, Tianshu. I'm, I'm sure there was an extension to it. Uh, there should have been either Selene or somebody because it has, I mean, Surya is there like all the other Surya images that you find in the Kushana period in Mathura. And then I went to went up to Bamiyan and looked at this. I mean, I was not the first person to say, I mean, this was also the idea of Benjamin Rowland and Klimberg Salter. Um, it's, it is not just Mitra. I mean, it's it's Buddha in as a, uh, as Mitra that uh, uh, appears on the paintings of, uh, because there is, uh, if you look at all the paintings, I went through all the books written on that. And also luckily, uh, thanks to my spiritual mother, uh, Francine Tissot, um, I had, I mean, I have her archives with the photographs when she went to Bamiyan and look at all the photographs. There is nothing um, uh, other than Buddhist. I mean, I'm sure it is Mitra who is depicted um, uh, in Bamiyan, but it is a message. So uh, this is what I was trying to do in this book, to find the hidden message uh, of it. So uh, just to conclude, I mean, I told you yesterday, I'm not going to talk for a long time. So book is there. I mean, I'm, I'll be very happy to accept any criticisms um, because um, I mean, it is it is almost like an essay that I wrote it. And I, I, if I go for the second edition, I will always correct myself. Um, I mean, I've, I've taken into account all what, what you said, Monica and also Tian Shou, to develop it. Um, uh, in the third book, I, I would like to, in the Gandhara Nath Revisited, um, I'm trying to publish the full um, stupa of Bunir with all the, I mean, I know that Tianshu is working on that as well. Um, uh, and also the so-called uh, Dionysian uh, scenes in a Buddhist context and to see whether what is Dionysian and what, and what is not. And also the question of cataphractus, the heavy armor, and also the miracles. I know Monica has written on that. Um, on the miracles and also to look at the, especially the talk I gave in Leipzig was on the the twin miracle and there was a lot of misunderstanding about it because, I mean, I mean there were five places where Buddha, uh, uh, Buddha performed this miracle. But if you look at iconographs, we have only two, one is Kapilavastu, other one is Sravasti. So, uh, so this is what I'm trying to do in the, in the coming book. Um, as I said yesterday, when we had an uh, unofficial discussion uh, with my good friends, Monica Tianshu, oh, sorry, Tianshu was not there, but with uh, Suchandra, um, um, I, I hope to organize uh, another international colloquium in Strasbourg next year, especially to discuss what this, what you have pointed out, the relationship between the iconography and the text. We are the confusions of word, contradictions, confusions in the text and contra contradictions in art. So this is what we we have to do. And, and this is what the message that we are, we should give to our students to look at, um, um, look at the art in a different angle. And also it's extremely important to know the text. Without the knowledge of the text, iconography will be lost. So it is in this context, I wrote this book. You are, I mean, all the readers are most welcome to tell me what is good and what is not good. And I'll be very happy to um, uh, accept them. And I also, I will think about the comments that Monica and Tian Shu and also Suchandra will make on the book. And if I go for a second edition, I'll definitely correct them. So thank you very much for, for your support and for being here. And it is always nice to be with friends um, and, and good friends and intelligent ones. <laughs> so, <laughs> we are honored and privileged. <laughs> it's yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Osmond. And I look forward to your Buner Stupa because I'm, uh, as you know, I'm uh, I'm more into interested into the Dionysiac scenes because I try to see them whether we can relate them with everyday life or in as a whole in the Northwest and other things. So I'm very much interested, and I look forward to the next thing. So now let us, uh, Smita, I think she can help us if there is any, there are any questions. Uh, we had a very stimulating discussion on the book. And the bloke is slim, but it is very deep, as 
the Anishu mentioned, and so it has a lot of facets. Uh, so now, uh, Smita, uh, is there any question? Uh, no, there is no question till now. So I think we keep this okay. part. I think, yeah, I think people have to read the book first to get uh, an idea. Like today they have got an idea of the book. Now they will read it and then maybe next next time we'll have a lot of questions. So uh, Tianshu and Monica, if you want to make any last minute comments or whatever, otherwise we should close. And I think there will be more proposed. Uh, thank you. Sir. Just to thank Osmond for this wonderful book and just say we are waiting for the new ones. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, me too, me too. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, we are all in different part of the world. Um, uh, even without uh, 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 this pandemic situation, it's rare to actually meet in person, but we meet in the, in how to say, like we meet in our mind, in our research field. I don't know what we meet very often when I was reading your book. <laughs> and Monica's work, you know, I go over them over and over again. Right. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Smita, for publishing this wonderful book. And I'm sure the series is coming out uh, one by one. And so the last word is yours. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So we are almost uh, at the end of the program, and it's time for vote of thanks. I thank everyone for your cooperation and your presence. We would like to show our gratitude to the author for giving us the opportunity to publish his book, and our thanks to Professor Ghosh, Professor Zin, and Professor Zhu for kindly giving your valuable time and opinion. And special thanks are due to Mr. Bhaskar Dash. Without his help, it was not possible to finish the work in time. And I would like to thank my friend Shoma Koch for all her support. And last but not the least, I thank Professor Shushmita Boshima and uh, for sending a brief review of the book. And one announcement is there that our uh, two books are coming in, uh, 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 I think, uh, within a few months. And those are uh, one by Dr. Rohini Kaur, entitled Religion at Crossroads, Traversing Through the uh, Brihad Dharma Purana. And another one is in Bengali, Durga Mohisha Mordini Noy by Gaurav Devnath. And this is all. Thank you, everybody. Thank See you, you all. <laughs> Maybe sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was lovely to refresh the memory. Memories. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 B